technology has invaded our lives. The average person feels compelled to check their phone every 4.3 minutes. It is estimated that you will spend seven and a half years of your life watching TV and another five years on social media. Technology has changed the way we communicate, connect with the world, and entertain ourselves. But it has come with a price. It has left us distracted, disconnected, and completely consumed. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Brian, as, uh, as uh, Ken was telling you guys earlier. And uh, I'm so excited about being here with you guys. This is uh, our, our third service. And so now I'm convinced that you're just trying to kill your staff. I mean, I, I, I don't know how you guys do this. Actually, I was thinking there's a church I go to every other year in Denver that does five weekend services. And I was like, I, I actually told them in all seriousness, I said, you should cut two. <laughs> like, there's no way I would stay on staff here. But um, anyway, I, I actually texted my wife after the second service. I was like, wow, this place seems so much like the last church that we served at in Memphis. And uh, now that church closed its doors a few years ago. So, but um, uh, but uh, nonetheless, I it just the feel of the place, the the people, the the, the God's spirit in here. And by, by the way, I just want to say just, as, as an outsider, I've been here of all of like four hours, you know, speaking so far. But um, as an outsider, I think sometimes when you come to a church and you get used to being here Sunday after Sunday, and you kind of come in and you take your seat, like you know, what I'm saying like that's your seat, right? Like. You probably sit in the last seat, same, same seat last week, right? And you just get kind of used to it. You drop your kids off the same place. You sit in your seat, and it's easy to lose perspective. And I just want to say as an outsider, it is so evident that God's doing stuff here, you know? And, and I don't mean that to praise you guys at all because, you know, I, I know his, it has nothing to do with us. We're just here to be tools uh, used by him. But um, it, it is just so apparent. I mean, God's spirit is here and, the worship this morning, wow, through music, wasn't that incredible? I love being able to be in a place where you feel, and I, I love amp up, I'm, I'm ADHD, so I love amped up music, you know what I'm saying? But I, I that just felt so peaceful at the end, so, so affirming. I mean, great job, wherever you guys are, wherever they disappear to, great job. Um, thank you. <clears throat> so um, you guys, uh, I, I get to travel full time all, all around the country. I served as a staff pastor for uh, 13 years. And then uh, 16 years ago, um, I said 15 last year, 16 years ago, I resigned from my position as a teaching pastor and started writing and speaking full time. And now we've gone to uh, 47 states. And uh, I, I told the last service that um, if, if anyone knows anyone in South, South Dakota, Hawaii, or Alaska, I'll give them a discount on a speaking trip And because um, I'd love to check them off our list. And then Ken came up after me afterwards and said, I know a friend in South Dakota, so you can you know, put that on your list. And um, so if anyone, particularly if you know anyone with beachfront property in Hawaii, that, I, would, I would prefer that uh, experience. But um, anyway, my wife gets to travel with me quite a bit. She's going with me to speak uh, in Tampa, Florida next week. So we're going to go spend some, a little bit of time afterwards in uh, uh, Universal because we're empty nesters and now we get to experience Harry Potter without children. So um, uh, I'm not sure that makes us creepy or cool, but uh, nonetheless, we're doing it. So um, anyway, we get to travel and, and speak. We've gone to 11 different countries, and it's just been an amazing, incredible life raising our kids and, and now getting to experience life together. And, um, and I, I'm excited about being here with you guys because you're in the middle of this series called Consumed, talking all about technology and how it affects our lives. And I just commend your church. I mean, that's just such an unusual thing. I get to call the churches all the time to talk about technology and, and family discipleship and, and multi-generational uh, parenting and all those kind of things. But it is rare that I ever hear a church talking about technology in the main service. I think because it's almost like we have like 10 different topics we cycle through, you know, in church on Sunday mornings. That's all we ever want to talk about. And for you guys to address something that I think is so pivotal to our culture and to our lives as Christ followers is, is just amazing. And so I'm grateful that I, get to be, I get to be a part of that today. And, um, you know, I really think technology, it's, it's, it's kind of like one of those, uh, every generation has their issue. And, and kind of the thing that represents that generation, you know, and we look at the 60s and it's like the peace generation and the 70s is all about disco music and bell bottom blue jeans and, you know, the 80s was the me generation and, you know, I don't know, neon clothing. And I think we're going to look back at your kids, 
you know, 50 years from now, and we're going to call this the wire generation because they've never known life without technology. They just, they've always been wired. It's almost like the doctor cut the umbilical cord and attached a Wi-Fi cable for your kid. You know, they've just, they've just always been wired. And, and it's, it's really changed a lot about how we engage in our life. And um, speaking of how we have changed, um, you know, I really believe that all of life is spiritual. And, uh, and, and, and what happens is sometimes we, we engage in our spiritual life on Sundays and we think that, you know, I, I connect with God for 40 minutes on Sunday morning or in eight minutes on my quiet time in the mornings or whatever that might be. And, you know, I have my work life and my home life and my extracurricular life and my volunteer life and we have all these little boxes. And, but I really think that all of life is meant to be spiritual and, and we, you saw last week in Genesis chapter 1, do you guys remember that? Anyone here last week? Genesis 1, we saw that, that God created, <coughs> that God had a plan, a purpose, a design, that it's not some cosmic roll of the dice, that we've ended up the way that we are and where we are, that there was a purpose behind this whole thing. And so that, that God is not just concerned about our, our marriages and relationships and finances, which is always safe topics to talk about. Instead, if all of life is spiritual, then I think that God's concerned about how we use technology also. And so we need to create what I call a theology of technology, and which that'll preach, by the way, which I guess is good since I am preaching. So anyway, uh, we have to create a theology of technology and begin to think biblically about how we're using the technology in our life. Because I don't, I don't think technology is not evil. Technology is not good or bad. It's innate. You know, it doesn't have a soul, a consciousness, but instead it's how we use it that can become unhealthy and even sometimes ungodly. Uh, then the way that we use it toward ourselves and toward one another. And, and so, um, you know, it's changed so much about our lives. And, 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 uh, and, and the, the Apostle Paul, he wrote to the church at Rome. He wrote to many different churches, but one of the churches he wrote to was kind of a new experience. It was a very cutting-edge experience for a church back then in that um, it was a multicultural church. There were people from all over the known world that were there in Rome. And they were primarily, it was the first church made up of uh, uh, people that were once uh, part of paganism and that were Gentiles and they gave their life to Christ and then people that were Jews that now gave their life to Christ and now they're coming together trying to form a church. I mean, I, uh, there's happy days there. And now at the, near the end of this letter, he says something uh, to them about what it means to be following Christ. And this is what he says. He says, do not be conformed any longer to the behavior and customs of this world, but be transformed. I mean, like, there, there is a transformation process that has to happen, that does happen in every one of us. You know, that uh, I really believe, and I'm sure that you do as well, that the, the, the day, whenever the day was, long ago, maybe at Bible camp or here on a Sunday morning, that you gave your life to Jesus, that your child gave their life to Jesus, that boom, that very second, you became, your child became a new creation. Yes, you've heard this verse before. You became a new creation. All things are dead. The old is dead. Now you're new in Christ again. And in Philippians chapter 1 tells us that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it, meaning that that very moment that you gave your life to Christ, there is a transformation process that began to occur in you. And that transformation process, that work that God has begun, he says he will not stop that work until Christ comes back again. And that work that he is doing in us, in you, is not contingent on how many Bible verses you know, how much money you've given to the church, how many Bethmore Bible studies you've attended. It's contingent on one thing, and one thing only, and that's what Jesus accomplished on the cross, and then boom, he said, it's done, it's finished, my promise is we'll always be there. And so I don't, I don't have to worry, I don't have to be, be stressful, God, are you at work in me? Yes, he always is. He has promised us that in Philippians. But there is a, a response. It's kind of like uh, when James talks about faith or that works is dead. It's kind of about two sides of a coin, faith and works. Does that make sense? And so in the same way, there is a, 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 a response that we have a role to play in this transformation process. And he says, don't conform any longer to the pattern and behavior of this world, but be transformed by the what? Renewing of your mind. Exactly. That there has to be, he does he say, he doesn't say, go and be a better person and then you'll be transformed. He doesn't say, go and learn more and you'll be transformed. He doesn't say, go and, 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 uh, and, and gumption up enough energy or enough strength or be a registered Republican or anything like that. All he says is, have a renewing of your mind and then that's the, tra the transformation process happens. 
Meaning that we've got to begin to change our minds about some things. You know, is, isn't that really what the word repent literally means? Repent means to turn a different direction, to go a different direction. So he's saying we've got to repent. We have to change our minds, renew our minds daily, and that's our role in the process. So it's basically me coming every day, you coming every day and saying, God, there is a design behind the way that you have made life to work. We saw that in Genesis chapter 1. And God, as the creator, you know best how life is supposed to work. You know, if you had a watch and your watch broke, where would you take it to get it fixed? Would you take it to the vacuum cleaner store? Would you take it to, I don't know, to your, you know, your, your CPA, your doctor? No, you would take it to a watch store because a watchmaker knows best how a watch is supposed to work. Does that make sense? In the same way, we have a, we have a universal, a watchmaker of the universe. He has made us, and there's an order and a design. In the same way, so we are to submit ourselves and say, God, would you renew my mind every day? So you can continue this transformation process. But what technology has done is technology has, has shifted our minds. It's, it's changed our understanding about how some things work in life. And one of the things that it's changed is it's changed our understanding of community. It's changed our understanding of relationships and intimacy and how we, just, how we connect in our humanity toward one another. You know, like all of us can remember, if I, if I just say the word childhood to you, what are some immediate things that come to your mind? You, I, I'm guessing a lot of you immediately begin to think of friendships that you had as a kid. I can remember my three best friends I had when I was in fourth grade because we were the three, we were the four musketeers. Now, I realized there was three of them, but we were in fourth grade and we were all boys and we thought that was cool to call ourselves the four musketeers. But anyway, I can remember all their names and what we did together. Like we were just the best of buddies and because life is all about relationships. You know, I can remember when I was a kid, if we wanted to, if you wanted to hang out with your friends, what would you do? Somebody tell me, what would you do? This is where you get to talk out loud in church. It's kind of a cool thing, isn't it? Right? Get to be a little charismatic today. So what would you do if you want to hang out with your friends when we were kids? He's like, you go to the house, ride bikes, go to the park, you're outside, yes, right? We would leave the house. I remember when I was a kid, I would walk out the front door during the summer months and say, hey, okay, my mom, I'm gone, as if I'm going to my job, my childhood job or something, right? And I, I'd ride my bikes three miles this way to the library or three miles that way to the park. And as long as I was at home at night before the street light came on, mom was good to go. She never once said, would you text me when you get there? <laughs> she never even said, would you call me on the phone so I can know where you are? It was just like, we're just out there doing life, you know, as kids, hanging out, you know, with our friends, you know, in relationships. But that's not how our friends connect, our children connect with their friends anymore, is it? Now, I'm not saying it's good or bad. It's just how generations change. Can, can I borrow you for just a second? You know, when, when, when you and I and, and our generation, if we want to connect with one another, we sit knee to knee, face to face. Yes. So I can I can see your body posture. I can see your eyes. I can I can see your tears and your laughter and your smile. And this is not uncomfortable. It's just two men connecting. OK, you know, like this is how we connect with one another. Right. Like, like face to face and we talk. And but this generation, how do they how do they connect with one another? Oh, we've all got our streams out. And no one is even looking at each other. That feels kind of nice, by the way. Okay. So, I, like, like we're, 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 uh, you've seen this happen in your own family, haven't you? Like, like, you all get together and you're having dinner at a restaurant. Like, you're spending real money having some family time together. And then 20 minutes into it, teenager, you know what I'm talking about. 20 minutes into your interaction, no one is talking anymore because we've all got our screens out. Spending time with people that aren't even in the room with us for crying out loud. How crazy is that? I'm going to spend money on a meal, not even talking to the people around me. Thank you very much. You know, about, that's what technology has done, isn't it? It's almost as if we have lost part of our humanity because of screens. We've forgotten what it means to dignify one another. Do you know what it means to, to, to give someone dignity? It means that, that with, with your body language, with your eye contact, you're saying that there's nothing more important in this moment than you right now. That's dignity. But what we've done is we are robbing one another of dignity because we've got these things between us. I apologize, camera person. You just got to keep up with me, okay? So, so when, when you're, when you're in, the, in, in presence of another human being and you're talking with someone and there's a screen between the two of you, you've gone to the dark side. You know what I'm saying? 
Because you're saying that this thing is more important than this person right there in front of you. And I get to meet people every day. It's so fun for me. I was at the, at the uh, um, total, total sidebar. I was at the airport yesterday, and this woman, she's obviously having a grumpy, grumpy day. And, um, and I said something about, you know, uh, are you enjoying being here today? And she goes, well, I'm almost done. That means I get to go home. I said, that means you made money today, didn't you? And she goes, well, I guess I did. I said, what are you doing tomorrow? And she goes, I'm coming back to work. I said, and then you'll make more money tomorrow, won't you? And before you know it, within 45 seconds, she's laughing, she's smiling, because that's what human interaction does, doesn't it? You can't do that on the screen. Right. You, you just can't. I mean, there's, there's something about seeing someone face to face. But what happens is sometimes, especially as, 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 as parents, you know, let's say that you, you, you got a, a middle schooler daughter and you're the carpool mom, the carpool dad, and you, you pick up your kid from school and you, and you say to them every day, hey, how was school today? And they usually go, oh, I, I, I don't know. But all of a sudden now, you, you say, how was school today? And your daughter goes, oh my gosh, mom, you're not going to believe what happened today. I was in the library and this boy came in and she starts telling this great story. And then all of a sudden your phone rings. And you say, hey, on, sweetie, let me get this real quick. Yeah, I see your face. Like, I don't know any other way to say it than I think that you just dishonored your kid. Because you were saying this thing was more important than this living, breathing person sitting in front of you. This person who's not only made in the image of God, but they have part of your DNA in them. Like, how important is that? Gosh, somewhere along the way, parents, we just got to... We just got to set this stuff aside. We got to begin to dial down some of the noise, some of the brightness from these screens so we can just focus on that which is most important, these people around us. But this stuff is just, it's incredibly addictive, isn't it? The average teenager today now sends over 3,000 text messages every single month. Now, if you're a parent, the typical parent sends over uh, right at three to 400 text messages each month. That means that if you've if you got a kid in your house and they're sending over 3,000 and you're sending 300, they're using this stuff 100 times more often than you are. Again, that's not good or bad. It's just, it's just the reality of how the generations are different. Now, I partly understand it's because we text very differently from generation to generation. Like, like for instance, um, uh, 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 what, what is your name? Ben. Let's say, Ben, that you send me a text message right? And you say, hey, Brian, I really enjoyed meeting you in church today, period. I have some questions about that technology. Would you be available for lunch this week? Question mark. And I say, it was nice meeting you too, Ben, period. I would love to have lunch, exclamation point. How about this Thursday at 1130? Question mark. And you respond back with maybe a, a thumbs up. Now that's a whole conversation, isn't it? with nouns and pronouns and punctuation marks and full sentences because that's how the English language works. <laughs> but not with our kids. No, they can have complete conversations without using a single word, can't you? I know that you can. My daughter, when she was in high school, my kids are both in college now, but when she was in high school, I sent her a text message one day at school and I said, hey, I'm going to pick you up from school today instead of mom and we can go to Panera and get a smoothie and hang out together. And she responded by sending me a smiley face with a tongue hanging out and a birthday present and a shooting star. And I picked her up from school and I said, why didn't you respond to my message? And she said, I did. And I said, no, you sent me a smiley face with its tongue hanging out and a birthday present and a shooting star. And she said, and? And I said, and I don't speak hieroglyphics. I don't know what this means. I really don't. And you don't either, which is the point. They have created over 20,000 pictures and images that represent words in the English vocabulary. And, and we have no idea what they're talking about. <laughs> like, again, it's not good or bad. It's just how different it is. The average t high schooler today, now th they have all these apps that they're going on. And they, they go from one app to the next to the next. And like, If you've got a kid who's in about, I don't know, second or third grade, and you're concerned about Snapchat, let me just let you know, you can rest it, okay? Because by the time they get to middle school, it will be a long gone. Because this stuff comes about every six to eight year life cycle. And these apps, they come and go so quickly and are bought by new companies. So like the latest thing is, is TikTok. And everyone's so frustrated about TikTok. I promise you, in four years, we won't be using the word TikTok because it'll, it comes and goes so fast. But we have to keep up with these things as parents. And what happens is by the time that your kid graduates from high school, they're going to have the average high schooler has six different social media profiles. 
Now tonight, we're doing a, a special presentation with your, um, uh, your high schoolers and middle schoolers at Epic. Is what it's called? At Epic. That I'll be with there with them uh, doing, uh, talking about my wired life thinking biblically about technology. And one of the big issues I talk with teenagers about at public schools, private schools, youth groups, is that you are in control of your own digital reputation. That you are in control as a student of your own digital legacy reputation that no one can decide the kind of man, the kind of woman that you're going to be when it comes to technology except for you. And we end up sharing all this information about our lives on technology. Um, but by the time they graduate, it's going to be six to seven, some of them eight years worth of an unorganized, an, un, um, an uncalculable amount of information about your children is going to be on the web. And, and us as parents, unfortunately, we're using the first ones to put that information out there by posting all kind of stuff about our kids when they are kids. And, be, and we are the first ones to be careless with the information that we're sharing about our children. So they're sending over 3,000 text messages. They're in all these different apps. The most popular apps that high schoolers in America use is Instagram and Snapchat. Um, there was actually a survey done among 500 high school girls, and they asked them, what is their favorite social media app? And well over the majority of them said Instagram. Now, I'm not surprised by that at all. It's the use you can send photos and videos and, and have private conversations and those kind of things. As a matter of fact, I'm going to share at, at a workshop we're doing right after the service. We're having a luncheon at 1230 and then a parenting seminar called Becoming a Tech Savvy Parent at 1 o'clock. I know the registration for the lunch is, is closed, but you are still welcome. We would love for all of you that are parents and grandparents to come at 1 o'clock for this seminar because it's going to be way more than I can talk about here in 30 minutes in the church service, okay? And, um, but one of the things we talk about is just the danger of these apps. It's kind of some potential pitfalls. I don't think they're all necessarily bad, but we just have to be aware of some pitfalls with each one of them. And so uh, the majority of them, they love being on Instagram and sharing about their life. And they asked a follow-up question. How does it make you feel when you get on your Instagram profile? What does it make you feel when you're on your profile? Over 80% of all high school girls said that when I open up my Instagram, I feel stressed or depressed. Think about this. If Ken came up to us and said, hey guys, guess what? After the church service, I got a bonus, and so I'm going to treat all of us to, the, to Mexican food. And we all go out to the restaurant together, and 80% of us get food poisoning. And then next Sunday, we come back to the service, and after the third service, Ken says, hey, guess what? I love all of you so much. We're going to go back, and I'm going to buy lunch for you again today. Meet me at the same restaurant. Could we agree that most of us would say, no, thank you. I had enough chalupa last week, right? Because if 80% of us got sick, we're thinking, I learned my lesson. I know, thank you. I don't like food poisoning very much, which begs the question then, why do 80% of our daughters continue to go back week after week, day after day, to use an app that makes them mentally, emotionally, and relationally stressed and depressed. It's in part because they, they believe the same lies that our pop culture perpetuates. What happens is they, 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 they get on their screens and they scroll to these images and these videos they see on Instagram. And what the images basically tell our daughters in their brains and their hearts is, oh, you're not blonde enough. Oh, you're, you're obviously not tall enough, you're not skinny enough, you're not buxom enough, your hair will never look like that, your hips will always be too big, you're always going to speak funny, you'll never be good enough. If you're a high school girl in here, a middle school girl, you, you, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? That, that, that constant pressure, that artificial, pre that, that pressure to measure up to an artificial sense of beauty. You know, my, my, um, my kids... Since the time they were born, we had a Bible verse over each of their doors to their bedroom. And my son, when, when he was born, we put a Bible verse, uh, Joshua 1, 9, that said, uh, be strong and of great courage. And we had no idea that when he was born, that his Achilles heel, his whole life, he's 22 years old, and his, his Achilles heel has always been fear. Like fear of failure, fear of not measuring up, fear of not being smart enough, not being good enough. And so it, how, how, how prescient it was that at his birth, we put this verse to remind him. 
said, you don't have to be fearful. The he who made you is walking with you. My daughter, when she was born, we put a Bible verse up over her bedroom door. Psalm 1, 1, uh, 144 that says, I'm sorry, 138 that says, uh, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And every day of her life, when she was a little girl, we would pray bedtime prayers with her. And as we walk out of her room, we would say, hey, sweetie, don't forget, you're fearfully and wonderfully made. Just to remind her who she is. Any, any mom in here with a daughter? Mom with a daughter? You have a daughter? How old's your daughter? Eight, eight years old. So do you know what it means in the Hebrew language in the Old Testament when it says you're fearfully and wonderfully made? It literally means made with a sense of awe. It means roughly nine years ago when God was knitting that little girl together in your womb, all of heaven was standing there going, this one's going to be amazing. She's going to have part of you in her father. Isn't that incredible? How dare the culture come to our daughters and try to get them to the doubt their self-God-given worth. That when he, we, we, we got to help them to listen to the right voices. You know, we, um, I think one, another one of the things that's happened is with our, uh, our um, with culture, I mean, with technology, is it's changed our understanding of how to live out our sexual boundaries and our sexual identity. You know, our kids, when they were younger, we, we used to pray two big things for them. God, would you help our children to understand who you are and what it, means, what it means to be in a right relationship with you? And God, would you help them to understand what it means to be a man and what it means to be a woman? That I really believe that what will largely determine whether or not your child makes it out of adolescence with a whole and holy perspective on life is the degree to which they understand what it means to be in a right relationship with God and how to live out manhood or womanhood. And I'm not trying to make some, some statement about genders or, or transgender or homosexuality or anything like that. I'm just saying that I really believe, as I, I've worked with students now for almost 30 years, and I just see that, that technology has changed our understanding of what it means to be a man, what it means to be a woman, and what it means to show honor and dignity and respect to one another when it comes to our roles as men and women whether high school, middle school, or grown-ups, because of technology. You know, over, over 80% of all teenagers admit to having posting regrets. You know what a posting regret is, right? That's not saying, my mom is so mean. No, you just, just ask Kanye West or our president. They'll tell you about posting regrets, right? It's like, could you please just put the phone down and run the country? Thank you very much. You know, like it's those things that you say on social media that you think, man, I wish I could take that back. And unfortunately, it's not things about like what they think about us. A lot of times it has to do with their identity, their sexual identity, their, their gender. Over 40% of all teenagers admit to having convers sexual conversations on social media. 25% of them are having these conversations with complete strangers. One out of four of all teenagers are having sexual conversations with complete strangers. And I, understand, I, I don't want you to be just shocked by that. I want you to understand how it happens. And it's because of these two different shifts that are happening about community, relationships, and intimacy, sexual intimacy. Because what happens is if in, in the real world, if, if you and I were going we to hang out together and we wouldn't have coffee together this week, I, I'm not going to trust you after having one coffee with you. Right? We might have dinner again two weeks later. We began to, to hang out with one another, and, and after many months, there would be a, a trust level, right? Because we're getting to know one another in the real world. But what happens on social media is there's an immediate psychological and emotional connection with someone because we assume that the person we're connected to is one of us, meaning they're one of you. They understand you. They get you, which is why teenagers, you get this. You end up having very intimate conversations with someone because that you just met yesterday on TikTok or on Snapchat because you think, wow, this person is just like me. They understand me better than anybody at school. And we end up in a very intimate conversations with these people. We know that over 20% of all teenagers, it's 20% of all guys, one out of four of all girls admit to sending nude and semi-nude photos of themselves to other people. One out of four of all girls are doing this. 
You know, we're going to talk a lot about this in the seminar this afternoon to help you understand how, it, not just why it's happening, mean, that it's happening, but how and why it's happening so that you can help your child make a more godly choice the next time, okay? But um, it's happening one out of four girls, one out of five of all guys, and, and, and they're saying, sharing these things. And one of the things I tell kids all the time across this country when I go to public schools, private schools, and youth groups is that uh, you're... Here's a secret if you're a teenager in the room, okay? A secret your parents don't want you to know, and it's this. They don't control you. They can't control you. Yes, mom and dad? I mean, we better start living with that reality. I live with the reality that once my children walk outside the front door of my home, I lose all control, which is why I pray when they leave the home. God, would you help them to stay on the course that they have chosen for their life because I can have no control of what they're doing when they're outside of our home. I have some semblance of control inside the home. So I don't want to live some bravado manhood that says, I know everything that my kids are doing when the reality is we don't. Which means teenagers, this, only you get to determine the kind of man and the kind of woman that you're going to be when it comes to your reputation with social media. And we get one chance to do this. I can share story after story with you of teenagers that are losing college scholarships, that are losing career jobs after college because of silly things that they've said and done on social media because these things have potential lifelong consequences. I know this is hard stuff for us to talk about, but what's happening is our kids are being exposed to these things earlier and earlier in age, so by the time they get to high school, it's almost like they, 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 they don't even think about it anymore. My daughter, one day I was addressing, this is back when she was in high school, we, were address, we talk about these things very open in our family, by the way, and we were addressing this, and my daughter said, Dad, I know that you talk about this with us all the time. She said, but I have already seen so much of it by the time I was 11, by the time she was 11. She said, I think I'm just numbed to it now. Meaning they don't even see sexual boundaries the same way anymore because it's been so much a part of their life as an adolescent. You know, uh, we know that over 90% of all high school, by, uh, by the time they graduate from high school, over 93% of all guys admit to watching digital pornography. Two out of three of all girls admit to watching digital porn. Over 83% of all guys are watching group sex videos. I know this is uncomfortable to talk about in church. I applaud your church for asking me here and to address these hard things because I think God really cares about this stuff. So, so just give me a couple more minutes here. You know that we, we, we know that over 80% of them are, are, are in this. If you want to know whether or not your child might be looking at digital porn, just answer these questions. Do, do you live in an urban community? Are you politically conservative? Are you registered Republican? Do you come from a red state? Do you, uh, are you theologically conservative? Or do you have a college education? Uh, do your kids go to private school or home school? Because for everything that you say yes to, it increases the likelihood that your kid may be looking at porn. Now, obviously, we would look at those things, and say, but those are all things I want for my kids. Those are all good things, aren't they? Which is part of the problem. Because we, we tell ourselves a lie all the times as parents, and that is this. I want my children to have a better life than I had growing up. But the problem is, in order for our kids to, to have the lake house and the gated community and all the wingdings and whizzes of life that I want them to have that I didn't have, we've got to cheat something. Which means I've got to work longer, I've got to work harder, I've got to be absent even more from my family. All under the guise that I'm trying to do better by them, when really all they want from us is their time. They just want us. As much as they say, I want the new iPhone 11, I'm telling you, what they really want is you. They just want that time with you. And so we, we have got to begin to make some hard choices as parents to begin to say no to some things that are taking us away from our families so we have time to say yes to them. That I just want to be a yes parent. I, I don't mean yes, I give my kids everything they want. I mean, I say yes, that, that when my kids need me, when my kids want that time with me, my answer is yes. I don't want me to be distracted by these things that are just fleeting. I think so many of us in this room, as parents and grandparents, we are living very arrogant lives because we are living as if we have all the time in the world. See, my kids are both gone to college now, and I'm living with the reality 
that my season of greatest influence is over. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Like we, we have a short window to maximize your influence to transform their heart and mind. But it requires some decisions to say no to other things so you can say yes to God in hopes that your children will say yes to him as well. My daughter, before, let me close with this, but the day before she left for college two years ago, she was, she, our house was filled with boxes and crates as she was packing everything to leave for college. And I'm the night owl in our family. I'm, I'm always up every night till 1 or 2 a.m. and at working and, 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 and writing. And my daughter, she's, uh, she would like put herself to sleep at 9 o'clock at night, every night as high schooler. Like one night, I woke her up at 9.30 on a Friday night and said, you're a horrible excuse for a teenager. You should be out causing mayhem and calling me at midnight. Now go back to sleep, you know. And, uh, but anyway, this night, it was the night before she was leaving for college. I was in the kitchen about 11 o'clock cleaning up, and I hear a voice behind me. And it was my daughter, and she said, hey, Dad, can I talk to you for a minute? Yes. And we sit down at the kitchen, kitchen table, just the two of us, and began to talk. And I don't know how many dads out here with daughters, but, I mean, within a 30-minute conversation, it's eight different topics. Yes. And I, I'm just trying to keep up. I don't even remember what we talked about. All I know is this, is by the time we were done, it was after 1 a.m. in the morning. And the whole time she was talking, I was just praying. And it was a very simple prayer. God, would you just let her keep talking? Because I just want this moment. I just want this time to stop. I wonder if this week... This week, maybe, maybe you can just set these things aside for a few moments. Maybe you could just turn the brightness down a little bit so that we can hear his still, quiet voice. We can see his glory magnified a little bit brighter as we come together in community as families to say, God, this is the thing that is the most important to me. Would you guys pray with me? Father, we thank you for this time together. And um, I, 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 I know it's just not, it's not fun to talk about this stuff. God, we would, we would much rather um, act like that we know everything, that we know all the answers, that we know the ins and outs and everything happening with our kids. But Father, I, I, I know that we don't. And I know there's some parents in here this morning and grandparents that this stuff is particularly hard because they've already seen things on their kids' devices and they've already had hard conversations and that have just broken their hearts. And Father, we just pray for your, your mercy and your grace for them right now. God, I, I just want to speak on behalf of my brothers and sisters in this room as parents and grandparents and some of us great-grandparents. and God, we just want to tell you thank you. Thank you for this once-in-a-lifetime privilege that you've given us to partner with you to raise them to be like your son. God, I don't want to, I don't want to take that privilege lightly. You could have had any other plan. But for whatever reason, you gave me to Father, you talk about in Hebrews about offering ourselves to you as a living sacrifice. And God, we just want to do that right now. This is, we, we've worshipped you through music. We worshipped you through our finances already today. And Father, we want to worship you right now with our bodies. By just laying ourselves down before you as a living sacrifice. Just right now where you're seated, would you just maybe just kind of hold your hands out in front of you as a way of saying, God, I am offering myself to you anew today as a mom, as a dad, as a teenager, as a grandparent. God, I just need you. Father, we ask that you would receive 
these hundreds of gifts all around this room and that it would be pleasing and joyful to you that it would bring a smile to you to see us worship you with the giving of ourselves and our families we pray this for your name and your fame jesus amen